internet problem. But thank God. Well, let's hope it holds. All right, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can be here. We thank you, Lord, for your many mercies. Watch over us. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we can come and study your word. We pray, Lord, that you guide our conversation, illuminate our minds, Lord, guide us as we look into your word, have a greater understanding of it. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. Jesus, I forgot my Bible. We'll see how far we can get today. Go ahead, you can start reading. Oh. I'm just gonna my Bible. I didn't take it out. Okay. But by, by the time we by the time you get back, we'll have finished the passage. No, you won't. Yes, I will. I have my hand. I just <laughs> have to go a little ways. I keep it in the living room. Okay. <laughs> I'd rather I give you it. I just take, have to... take your take your time. Take your time. What did you say with Ephesians 4? Ephesians right? 4. And we're going to begin with verse 11, which is where huh. we left off. I got it. Got it? Uh-huh. Right. Victor, would you read verse 11 to 13? Yes. <clears throat> so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Any initial questions? When you say become mature, is not that uh, some translations say to become perfect? Yes. Because the, the Greek word is perfect, teleos. But um, but what it okay. refers to, of course, is uh, it, it means to <laughs> to be to be perfect, to reach a goal, to mature. So it has all those connotations. But the, it is the Greek word for perfect, for reaching a goal, which is what he's talking about. Obviously, it cannot be perfect. Okay. Because it's talking about here, earthly, you know, just like the passage that I'm going to be quoting when we get there is like, you know, um, when Jesus says, be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect. And that same Greek word there. But obviously it cannot mean perfection. Right. Right. We can never be like God in this life. Impossible. Uh, the only time we will be perfect in that sense is when we are face to face with God, when we have uh, when we're in heaven, not here. And this is talking about here. It's not talking about, you know, we're trying to prepare believers so that one day so, in heaven they'll have maturity or perfection, so they'll have it here on earth. And again, doesn't mean that we don't sin, doesn't mean that we don't mess up. It means that that we are mature, that we know that we do mess up, we do sin, but we also know how to deal with sin. We don't we don't condone sin, we don't embrace sin, we don't uh, entertain sin. Um, we call sin a sin and we know mm -hmm. when we do it, we repent and we, and we get right with God. And that's part, and that's part of what maturity entails. But yeah, that's the is it is seen. So, the, so the word, the word "perfect" in Greek, is not the same as the word "perfect" in English. No, because it has other okay. connotations. It, it translate. Can, okay. It can be perfect. It can mean, like I said, you know, reaching a goal, attaining okay. attaining a certain height. So no, it doesn't mean just mean perfect. If it just meant perfect, then of course it'd be like. Then there'd be no doubt about what he's saying, but you know, again, it can be mature. So these are these are the possible meanings to the word. Okay. So that's why you'll see different translations going different directions. They're not they're not creating them. You know, the NIV for it, it's not perfect, but it's not trying to. Hmm. I should, it's not trying to create a meaning. Sometimes it does. I do. I, you know, I was going to say it never creates, but it's not true mm -hmm. because when it wrote when it translated flesh a sinful nature. It was. It means it was already accepting a certain theology and imp imposing that theology on mm -hmm. people, and uh, we have to be. That's why it's good to have different translations and see what they say. And um, but again, um, I still don't care much for the King James. I think that uh, besides the fact that it's become like a cult, um, right? I don't, I don't really see it because and, uh, hmm? they're very radical. The people yeah. that. Uh... 
the, the more I listen to the guys, the more radical they are. Yeah. I was just, just this week, I was dealing with an issue because I was listen, uh, looking into this guy, um, B.F. Westcott, who was a, a very famous commentator, and he was also involved mm -hmm. in the in the in the Greek textual work that led to, to a number of translations that we have today. And so, but when I went to look him up in the internet, oh my goodness, all the things I could find was just vile things by King James people accusing oh, him yeah. of being in the occult and not believing in Jesus, not believing in the resurrection, all things that were not true. And I was thinking they've never read B.F. Westcott. That's horrible. Um, they, they accuse him of being uh, corrupted. Yeah. Which again, you know, they what they don't understand, of course. Well, it just, I'm just amazed that in the age where we have the greatest accessibility to knowledge, we have the greatest ignorance. Mm -hmm. That that is profoundly disturbing to me. How we can have all this knowledge and yet have incredible morons who get on YouTube, they record whatever they want to record, and they post it out there like nothing. With no real, I don't know, they, they, they call themselves Christians. I don't know how they call themselves Christians because they're mm. not conscientious of the fact that you're lying. You're, yep. you're presenting false evidence. You really haven't done your research. Um, you know, that's that's just sad. If you haven't done your research, shut up. But they don't shut up. They think, again, YouTube has made superstars into people who are idiotic. And they come mm -hmm. up with these cool, these cool videos. I was watching the videos they make about BF West. I was really cool. I mean, they had all the visuals, you know, and, and saying that he was into the occult and they put all these cute little images. But again, not once, not once in like 30 minutes that I watched this guy talking, did he reference anything academic or any reference at all? He was just talking. He never said, well, if mm. you look at this book or if you look at his writings on the Gospel of John or the uh, or the Epistle to Hebrews, you see where he says this. Never, never. Hmm. Just hearsay of, of the things that, you know, and they were confronted. I remember one time they were confronted about one of those things uh, because they said, oh, these guys, uh, Westcott and Horde did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a little bodily resurrection. And somebody showed them a volume that I think it was Horde who wrote a, a, a whole volume defending the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So what did they do? They went into the book and started using it to say that he was being a liar, that he really didn't believe it, that he was just he was just twisting things to really? make it look like he believed. And, and I was like, wow, that, you know, that reminds me, that reminds me of the guy who says, you know, that, that goes to the doctor and says, doctor, I'm dead. I'm dead. And it's like, you know, the doctor said, well, did, do dead men bleed? And he says, no, of course not. So he cuts him and he starts bleeding. He goes, and the man says, wow, dead men do bleed. You know, <laughs> you know it, it, it just continues on with their, with their craziness. Mm -hmm. But the, the importance of the NIV, I think, is because, and, and what I do frown upon the King James, it's a translation is meant to be relevant, to right. be understood. Understandable. If, if you, you know, like, and I was reading about the NIV, I didn't know this, that the, the first guy who uh, who started working in the NIV, it started because of a businessman who wanted to present the gospel to his friend, and he was, he read from the King James, and the guy laughed. And the guy said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> the language is mm. so, so obscure. So he realized we need a modern translation. That's how the NIV story was given birth. And now, mm -hmm. of course, this is incredible, massive work by so many scholars. But um, yes, I, I, it's important to have different translations and definitely to, to know these things. Because today you have all these wackos on, on the Internet saying all kinds of crazy things to support <laughs> their views without really substantial evidence they just i don't know how they do that that's 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 okay i again I, I forget that uh, any other questions no all right let's jump into this uh verse seven discusses the doctrine of spiritual gifts in general here paul narrows down to one particular grace gift god supplying leaders who will enable the church to grow this and in first corinthians 12 28 are the only place in new testament where charisma the greek word here uh, designates people rather than spiritual qualities of ministries. In in the letter to Corinthians, Paul uses charisma both to refer to the gift and to the person who has the gift. But here mm -hmm. is particularly referring to a person who has the gift. Uh, gifted le leaders are not just hired or appointed, but are sovereignly bestowed uh, upon the church as a gift from God. Um, in other words, you can't pay someone to have these gifts. 
You can't pay someone and say, well, now you're going to be a pastor or now you're going to be an apostle. Now you're going to be a prophet. These are appointed by God. You know, God has gifted people to have these gifts and he's given them these gifts for the benefit of the church. Um, the, their purpose is not just to do the work of the Lord, but to train and involve every member in that work. Uh, every single gift that God gives and so far as these leaders is to help the people of the church to grow, mm -hmm. to mature, to become the people that God wants them to be. And all these all these things are, are vital. They are here. We either have five categories or four categories. Um, because, of, for example, in the... Uh, before um, pastor teachers, the definite article is there only with pastor, but not with teachers. So some people think it refers to one position, pastor teachers, or that there are two pastors and teachers. Now, of course, mm -hmm. there are pastors in the New Testament, and there are teachers in the Testament. Um, so the focus here could be either that they're talking about two different things, or that pastors, of course, should be, have the ability to teach. But we're going to get more into that. Now, this list, of course, is not comprehensive. Paul, for mm -hmm. example, doesn't mention deacons. He doesn't mention elders, or overseers, uh, although that may be synonymous with pastors. Uh, but there, are, but deacons are not mentioned. Deacons obviously are in office of the church to help the church as well. Uh, po possibly these particular uh, leaders receive mention here because they're all connected to the proclamation of the word and for training Christians for service. Uh, the first two categories of leaders, apostles and prophets, are part of the list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and designate two primary offices of the first century church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul called himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in two, chapter 2, verse 20, he talked about um, apostles and prophets being the foundation of the church. And remember, when we looked at that, we saw that some uh, believe that that's one of the reasons that there are no apostles or prophets today, because they were the foundation. They were the ones settling setting setting everything down and now they're no longer necessary uh in ephesians 3 5 apostles and prophets are presented as channels through whom the mystery has been revealed to the church uh they were still functioning that way in the fourth decade of the church in the 60s and 70s when paul writes uh first second timothy these things are still going on uh, mm -hmm. when when uh if john wrote the book of revelation in the late 80s 90s it was still going on so these things are still going on, but it was the early church. The question is, did it eventually stop? Uh, it is possible the category of apostles here goes beyond the nucleus of the 12, uh, obviously because Paul's an apostle, and there are other people who mention the apostle. Um, but now, with that said, any other question? We're going to jump right into the titles themselves. No. Okay. So the first one is apostle. The apostle literally just means messenger, somebody who is sent on a mission. Uh, for example, when Jesus talks to his disciples, the Greek word is mathetes, which means learner. When he sends them out, it's apostolos. Okay. So training is discipleship. You're being discipled, and then you're apostolos. You're being sent out um, to do the work. The apostles were, in the early church, were the missionaries and church planters of the early church. Uh, the word can be used in a general sense, but also came to refer to a particular group of people. So it was used in a general sense, of, as I've mentioned before, to like refer to missionaries. And sometimes you would have a church send someone somewhere, like when the church in Antioch sent Barnabas and Paul to do a certain work, that was apostolos, that's apostles. But the word is also used for a unique group of people which includes the 12, which are the 12 minus, of course, Judas, mm -hmm. who had to be replaced. Uh, and, of course, Paul and people like Paul. Uh, but they were unique. And Paul talks about them in the book of uh, Corinthians. Uh, they had certain qualifications. There were people that had to see the risen Lord. Uh, and seeing the risen Lord doesn't mean that you saw a vision or uh, you had a dream about Jesus. You hear some apostles talking about you know, um, uh, you know they 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 had a dream where Jesus appeared to them, and that's why they knew they were apostles. Well, no, these people saw Jesus literally. The twelve apostles were with Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, they saw him bodily when he was here. They saw him bodily when he rose from the grave. Um, right. When Paul sees Jesus on the road to Damascus, it's not uh, a mirage. 
It's the literal Christ, the resurrected Christ appearing to him. Same thing with John in the, in the book of Revelation. He sees the literal Christ appearing to him. It's not a dream. Uh, and so and that that's becomes a very important distinction. Secondly, they were able to perform signs, wonders, miracles. Uh, thirdly, they were commissioned by Christ. Again, a very literal commission, mm -hmm. not like, oh, I had a dream. No, no, that Jesus said, you know, just like he said to Paul, you're going to be a witness for me. You're going to go to the Gentiles. You're going to suffer for me. This is what he told the, the 11 apostles. This is what he told Judas too, but Judas betrayed him. Uh, and the one who replaces Judas, uh, if you remember the book of Acts, is someone who had to be with them from the beginning. Matthias. Matthias, who had seen all the things that Jesus had done, had no, had seen the resurrected Christ. So he was witness to all these things. This is what he could, he was commissioned by Christ. Um, so, of course, the important question is, are there modern apostles today? And you already know the answer for, to, to, for me is that no, of course not. Um, you can have missionaries today, but you don't have apostles. And even the early church acknowledged this. After the apostolic age, when leaders rose up after the apostles, their name became known as elders. They were called mm -hmm. elders. And then, of course, the title bishop came into effect. But they were never called apostles. Uh, this is something, of course, that happens in the Eastern Church. The, the leaders there are called apostles. But in the early church, when it rose up, all the church together, nobody was called apostle. Right. The only apostles were the, the ones in the Bible. And they were now elders. They were the ones who had the tradition handed down to them. Uh, so, no, there are no, no apostles. And, and Paul makes it very clear uh, when he talks about this that uh, they— they had to have all these qualifications that I mentioned before. And then he talks about when he's talking in 1 Corinthians 15 about the apostles, he says, and last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. Um, and it goes to show that Paul was the last one to physically see Jesus and be commissioned by him. Uh, all the other apostles already had seen Christ. They were already commissioned by him. After Paul, there are no more apostles in the technical sense of Peter, James, Paul, John, people like that. Um, any question there? So the, uh, is Paul called the 12 apostle instead of Matthias? No. He's never one of the 12. Okay. This is always one of the things that, um, one of the things that always comes to bite him, that... Uh, his enemies use this against him, okay. You know, like in Galatians, that he was not one of the original apostles. Um, in Corinthians, the Corinthians somewhere got the same, the same information, maybe from the from the false uh, brethren, also saying, "Well, you know, you're not one of the twelve. You're not one of them." You know, and so Paul has to really defend his apostleship very much in the book of, of Corinthians. And this is mm -hmm. why we know so much about what an apostle entails, that they were like missionaries. They had they were commissioned by Christ. They did see Christ. They, they performed miracles. Um, we knew that, we know that quite a number of them were married, like Peter, because it says, don't I have a right to what, to take a wife, a believing uh, believing uh, sister with me on on, on my trips, like, uh, like mm -hmm. Peter and stuff like that. So we learned so much more about apostleship because they questioned his apostleship. Um, but no, he never, he never replaced it. Ma Matthias was, was, uh, which is, which is really weird because we never hear about him, you know, uh, not that we mentioned, not that we hear too much, too much about the other apostles either. We don't hear much about Thomas. No, or well, Matthias, yeah. you know, they, they, Matthias is even worse because we barely, we only right. hear about him in Acts and that was it. That's it. Yeah. Never again. But of course, the reason he's elected uh, is is because of the symbolic meaning of 12, that they represent the renewed Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, the, new, the renewed people of God. So they, it becomes a very symbolic, important number. So he has to be replaced. Uh, and Luke is the only one, uh, and Paul, Paul also in 1 Corinthians 15, who actually uses the, the title, the 12. You don't see that in, in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of John, mm. but that's how... By the time Luke writes his gospel, they're already referring to these guys as the 12. 
Like, you know, we have the Magnificent Seven in the movies. Mm -hmm. They were the 12. People already knew who they were. They were the 12. Uh, but Paul was not one of them. And that's why he says abnormally born. And, and, and the abnormally born is, is possibly he's picking up an insult that they're throwing at him, that you are you are like an aborted child. You're like abnormal. Uh, and he takes the very title that's being thrown at him and says, yep, that's what I am. I'm uh -huh. abnormal. I was not born at the right time. You know, I came at a different time, but I am an apostle. And here are my credentials. And of course, the greatest credential he has is, he says, if I'm not an apostle, then what are you guys? <laughs> I'm the one who planted your church. I'm the one who started you guys. I'm the one who taught you. If you if I'm not an apostle, what are you? You're nothing no. then either. You know, and he, and he mocks him for that. But of course, um, that becomes important. Now, of course, today, you have a lot of people claiming to be apostles. Um, and super apostles. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I heard that uh, today. He's not only apostle, but super apostle. Well, that's even worse because that's actually a derogatory title that Paul talks in the book in the yeah. book of uh, in the book I of know. Corinthians. I remember he used, that he uses that title as a as a form of insult. Yeah. So as if they're using it that that goes to show how stupid they are that they're actually using a title. That's like saying I'm the Lucifer of today. I mean, that's you're using a title in the Bible is used negatively to talk to talk about a good thing. That's that's just like you know. You know, when when Catholics refer to Mary as the queen of heaven, mm -hmm. and I'm like, that's used in Jeremiah to talk about a, a, a an idol, a cult. A pagan, a pagan thing, yeah, right? Yeah, a blasphemous title. You yeah. a, you're taking a blasphemous title and applying it to Mary. Do you even realize what you're doing? This is like, you know? So, but again, there are today people who claim well, to be apostles. Yep, yeah, you can go ahead. They're not aware of that uh, words of Jeremiah in the Bible because they don't read the Bible. That's a now, problem. I have another, I have another question. Uh, sure. When they elected Matthias, they prayed to the Lord before they did that. Yeah. But they also threw the dice. Yes. Yes. Cast and uh, throwing the dice, it doesn't matter because they already pray about it. No, well, no. Casting dice, of course, uh, you know... The Lord worked through that because that was their only means of deciding. Obviously, these two candidates were equal. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at their resume, both were identical. You know, it wasn't like one was greater than the other. Both were identical. So which one do you go? Well, let's with? say if I compare that, let's say if I if I won, if I what if I'm offered two jobs and they're both equal. Mm -hmm. So I pray to the Lord. Uh, to help me in choosing the the job, yes, and I choose this one. Is the right is the right uh, choice because I already pray. Mm -hmm. But you didn't cast right? lots. You didn't. But it doesn't matter because you I already pray. Oh, no. there you go. The reason they cast lots, lots was a very common way of of mm -hmm. discerning the will of God in the Old Testament. The reason they have to do it this way. Is because the Holy Spirit has not yet come upon them. And mm. that's why I'm saying that we have to be very careful when we read the book of Acts to, to, to talk about something that is descriptive and prescriptive. Obviously, when we read in, in Acts chapter 1 that they cast lots to decide mm. for a leader, we don't do that today. We don't cast lots to, to vote for a leader because we have the Holy Spirit. Okay. They did not have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not descend upon them until Acts chapter 2. So this decision has to be go, they go according to what they know, and what they know is the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there is a casting of lots uh, to decide what God wants. And it was a very, it was a very common way of uh of divining what mm -hmm. God wanted and God did not want. So it was not, it was not wrong what they did. Okay. They actually were following the Old Testament method. After after Acts chapter two, you don't see anything like that. Mm -hmm. You don't see them casting lots for anything. They understand that, you know, they have the Holy Spirit now. They pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal things to them. And he will, whether directly or, or through a messenger, you know, through a prophet or somebody else. But not never again do you see casting lots. But again, this is a historical thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And so they're being very honest about what occurred. In the book of Esther, they did the same thing, but they did the pagan people. Mm -hmm. The Purim, yeah, they threw the caslats and they came like a certain month of the, of the year in which is gonna 
annihilate the Jews, mm-hmm. which is Man- Mount of Purim or whatever. But they did that on the other side. Yeah, of course. Uh, again, pa- pagans uh, had the same way. They had the same way of divination. But the difference mm-hmm. is, is God there? No, of right. course not. Mm-hmm. You know, this was a this was a sanctioned way for them to discover the will of God. So it was not unsanctioned. If it was unsanctioned by God, then of course Peter and the apostles would be committing an immoral act mm-hmm. by trying to find something in a way that they're not supposed to be finding. For example, there are things in the Old Testament that tells you don't go to a medium. You know, yeah. if you if you want to find out the will of God, don't go to some witch doctor. You know, or, or medium. So the person talks to the dead. And try to find out from them. On the contrary, in in the book of Isaiah, there's a, uh, I think it's Isaiah 58 or 38. There's mm-hmm. a harsh condemnation against mediums. Uh, you know, and basically it says, if they know the future, then let them tell you their future right. and what mm-hmm. awaits them for daring to defy me and do this. And of course, this is one of the big issues in the Old Testament with the witch of Endor. Right. Uh, Saul, the Saul, the king was supposed to abolish and remove all these mediums, but as they still existed, and he knew where they were, and he goes mm-hmm. to one of them. Um, and again, even though it's against God, and God is against it, God mm-hmm. used it to again condemn Saul for what he had done by allowing actually Samuel to come back. And look at the witch of Endor; she's so clever. She knows right. that she knows that this is all fabrication; these are all lies. And when she sees Samuel for real, she's scared because she 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 probably just conjured up demonic mm-hmm. stuff and things that were false. She was faking it so she can make money. And when she sees the actual the actual the actual Samuel there, right, she's terrified. Um, so yes, and that was one way that God condemned. He said, "Don't don't do this. Don't I don't allow." But casting lots was permissible. Obviously, okay. after Acts chapter two, it is not permissible. Mm-hmm. We should not be casting lots today to to okay. to figure out anything. Any other questions? No. Oh, again, uh, like I was saying, there are many people today who are who claim to be apostles. Um, right. We should never, you know, just like the in the and when Matthew says, "Don't call anyone this, don't don't call anyone rabbi, don't call anyone, don't call anyone apostle," that that is wrong. There are no apostles today. Uh, and anyone who claims to be an apostle is just trying to have an upper hand and somehow claim a certain authority that mm-hmm. no human being can claim. Right. Nobody nobody is like, if I believed, even the Pope or anybody else, if I believed that they really were like Peter and Paul, I would have to take all their writings as inspired by God. And I have to take everything they do as sanctioned by God. No man, no woman has that authority. Right. Um, and, and usually the joke that I tell people is that if anybody ever comes to me and says that they're an apostle and wants to shake hands with me, I go, I go praise God, brother, so am I. I'm an <laughs> apostle too. Because other, because all they're trying to do is say, I'm an apostle, you see? And you're just a pastor. And I have authority over you. Or you're a prophet or you're whatever, but I'm above you. <laughs> That's what they that's really why they're claiming it, because they're claiming mm. this kind of authority over everybody else. And I'm amazed that the group, besides, of course, the Eastern Orthodox, and besides the, you know, we look at the Catholic Church and we think, oh, the Catholic Church with all these titles and I Pentecostals do the same thing. I'm just shocked. Really? Every time I see Pentecostal people, I'm like, they have prophets, they have apostles, they got bishops. Uh, oh. They got all these all these titles. I'm a, they got bishops. I never knew Pentecost said <laughs> bishops. Now I hear about bishop so and so coming to preach in our church. Come this Sunday, you know. I'm like, mm-hmm. this is crazy. I mean, well, I know that there there are certain uh, black churches that have those kind of titles. Really, you know, like you know, like bishop so and so and stuff like that. And and of course, the Anglicans still have that. But I never knew that Pentecostals also mm-hmm. had all these all these titles w- uh, around as well. You know, and, and the the black churches have multiple titles. I remember, like I, I told you a story before, I was visiting a hospital to visit somebody. I can't remember who I was visiting. It was in Hackensack, mm-hmm. and the person the person in front of me, when when they went up to the table, uh, he was a pastor too, and she said, um, "Oh, uh, Reverend So and So," 
he, you know, so he says, no, 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 I am most reverent. He corrected her. I, you know, not reverent. I am most reverent. Hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, man, I said, I, I got to bring it down a notch. I can't let her call me most reverent. I, I was so tempted to say, no, I am bishop. So, But I said, no, no, forget it. Uh, I just told her I'm Pastor George. You know, you know I, we, we, we have a, a similar situation, let's say, in uh, South America, in Peru, uh, uh, as far as the uh, titles, you know, uh, professional title. Let's say you are a, a lawyer, uh -huh. okay, and you are called a doctor because you're a lawyer, <laughs> doctor A. And, uh, but there's so many lawyers that you cannot find <laughs> work as a lawyer. So wow. you might be driving, driving a taxi. But it doesn't matter because your mother will say, my son, the lawyer. It doesn't matter that he's yeah. the same with engineers or whatever. It doesn't matter what job you have yeah. in life. You always be referred not as a Miguel Perez, but Dr. Miguel Perez, mm -hmm. even though you never work as a doctor. But well, something... I, I understand. I understand that. They say, well, again, then maybe that's the same issue. It's an issue of status. But okay. but it should never be an issue of truth. Anybody who thinks that they have the truth because they have a certain title, that person is a moron. Hmm. That That is the last. You should never listen to anybody because of that. If someone tries to make you believe that somehow they are right because they are doctor so-and-so, or, or whatever that that is ludicrous that's insane mm -hmm. um you know because uh, because i'm a reverend because i have a master of divinity doesn't mean that i'm right i'm right because i have a correct understanding of the word of god mm -hmm. a true interpretation and the thing is that any single human being given enough resources can look up the answers for themselves today thank god we have the resources to be able to to cipher things, you know, any any single Christian, because thank God we have we have elementary education, we all can read and write. Uh, but once you learn sources, you can study for yourself. I remember when I was when I started when I became a Christian yep. fifteen, I started reading commentaries so quickly. And if you see, if you see my first commentary, I still have one the first on the pastoral epistles because that when the Lord was calling me to preach, I knew that I want to study that more than anything else. If you, if you look at it, you see all the notes, all the Greek words I was trying to put on, mm -hmm. on the side because I had to learn some. I was like, they were throwing Greek words at me. I don't know Greek. So I would put word, And then I didn't, I didn't know English too well either. I had to look up some words in the dictionary because I was like, I'm 15 years old. Come on. I'm reading mm -hmm. a commentary by by a man in his 50s who's been studying the word of God for God knows how long. And and even his English was much more developed than, than mine. So I had to literally mm -hmm. look at have a, I would have like a dictionary for the English and just write the Greek so I could learn Greek words. But I learned, I learned, I had the, the capacity to learn. Anybody has the capacity to learn. If somebody wants yep. to study the word of God, they can study it, they can learn. So um, again, I think apostles is being used to, to try to gain authority over others. And that is contrary to the word of God. Mm -hmm. The Bible makes it very clear that if you want to be the greatest, you must be the servant of all. You must be the least. You must be the humble one. Right. You must be like Christ. Wash the feet of the others. Then you will be great. That is greatness in the kingdom of God, not the other way around. But now I'm preaching. Any other questions before we go on? No. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Prophets. Um, the prophet uh, for Paul appears normally after apostles. They certainly have to be taken seriously as a form of authority. Paul instructions to the Corinthians are very, again, very important because they, he gives us a lot of information because this was one of the things in their church. Um, the Corinthian church is a very dysfunctional church and therefore a great church for learning because Paul wrote, writes about so many things. But he has to give them correction about prophecy because they have exalted things like tongues over prophecy. And he has to correct mm -hmm. them and say, no, 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 no. Tongues is good for spiritual things. For your own individuality or or there's an interpreter but otherwise prophecy is better because prophecy is preaching the word prophecy is telling others uh a word from god and that's more important mm -hmm. uh so prophecy was a gift whose pursuit paul encouraged and whose exercise was it was intended to be governed by the principle of love which again that becomes the big thing in corinthians it doesn't matter what gift you have if you don't have love it is meaningless you can have the greatest, most fantastic gifts. You can speak in tongues. You can have the faith to move mountains. You can have this great benevolence. You can have all these wonderful things. 
But if you don't have love, you are worthless. Mm -hmm. We need to have love. That is the center. Again, if we focus on what the word of God says, we won't get into these perversions, people who exalt the apostles or exalt prophecy. We will say you have to exalt love. Love is the demonstration that we are Christians. Um, and in spite of its significance, Paul had, was equally clear that it had limitations. Um, prophecy is both partial and temporary, as he says in Corinthians 13. When, when Christ returns, you won't need prophecy. You won't mm -hmm. need preachers. You won't need tongues. You won't need any of that. But you'll still, you'll still have love. You know, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. And that we're always going to have. And that's important. Again, prophecy was meant to edify, to encourage, to console. It communicated a direct message from God to the congregation, to a person. Uh, its very exercise might be all that was sufficient for an outsider to recognize that God was there. Uh, in other words, when, when somebody entered the congregation, if they heard someone speaking in tongues and they were just speaking in tongues, they'd be like, this is crazy. Right. Which even I, as a Christian, had that reaction. You know, when I when I when I was younger as a young Christian, I, I used to go to Pentecostal churches, and mm -hmm. it, sometimes you just look at it like it looked like an insane asylum. It really did. I yeah. mean, their their time of worship, there'd be people speaking in tongues. There'd be people having seizures on the floor. There'd be people raising their hand. There was this one guy. I kid you not. He must have been around late fifties, early sixties. Put me to shame. Um, <laughs> I was there as a kid. And I thought all I kept thinking was this guy's in great shape. What was it? What? The, how was he praising God? I kid you not. All he did was running around the sanctuary. Really? He was literally the whole time that they're worshiping. Someone singing in tongues, praying in tongues. Someone having seizures on the floor. <laughs> you know what are they called? Slain in, in the spirit. I can't remember what they called mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, this guy was literally running around and really? running around. I was like, well, he's in great shape. I never saw him panting. This guy's in this guy's a phenomenal. You don't have to go jogging, you don't have to go exercise. Right. But now imagine somebody walks in and sees that. What are they gonna think? It's a madhouse. It's a crazy house, yeah. This is crazy. And the only thing that kept me safe was the fact that I knew that I was a Christian and I'm okay. But if but even I thought it was crazy, and it wasn't like it just happened that one day. Every mm -hmm. single Sunday, it's just this is the way they did it. This is the way they worship. People just you're basically yeah. doing their own thing. It's not like you're saying, "Oh, you're worshiping." You're all singing the same song together. You're all praising God together. It was just like a mayhem, mm. and uh, and of course there was prophetic words as well. But that was after mm. crazy stuff. Um, but again, this is this is something that's supposed to be uh, done to edify the church. Uh, it must be done in order. Again, in the Corinthian church, there was a lot of disorder. And so Paul has to literally lay down regulations. Okay, mm -hmm. you can only have three prophets to it first. And if somebody has a message from God, then whoever's talking can sit down. He can share it later. This person will share it first. He literally has to give them instructions because I'm sure that their congregation looked like the mayhem that I was watching, where it was just... Everything goes. And he was like, no, ha you know, God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. If you walk into a service and there is chaos, that is not from God. And Paul makes it very clear, no. And he makes it very clear that if you are a prophet and something happens and you have to shut up, you can shut up. He mm -hmm. makes it very clear that you have control over your gift. Again, some of these people that you saw, that I saw, look like they had no control. Like if you told them to stop, they couldn't mm. stop. They kept doing their thing. It was the, the pastor and people had to like calm them down or whatever. No, you have control. If you're speaking in tongues, according to the word of God, and there's no translator, you can shut up mm -hmm. and keep it to yourself. You can. If you can't, then we should question what kind of spirit you have. Because again, you can. He said the prophet has control of their own body, their own thing. Mm -hmm. Again, when we are worshiping God, it is, it is spiritual worship. It the Holy Spirit never possesses us, like you see demonic possession. And sometimes you see these people who are demonically possessed. They don't have no control mm -hmm. of themselves at all. They are completely being controlled by something else. 
that never happens in a Christian context. In a Christian context, we have control. As a pastor, when I'm preaching, if someone were to literally tell me, shut up, I could literally shut up. You know, I remember one time I was preaching. Oh, I can't remember the lady's name now. Elsie mm. Boylan. Uh, I was preaching and she was sitting there. And all of a sudden I saw her tilt her head forward. And, you know, she was an elder lady. And she wasn't moving. I got scared. I stopped my sermon. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I addressed myself to see if she was okay. And I had a deacon go over. And she, she said, you're just feeling tired. And she was, and she leaned forward. But I, I, I didn't. I didn't say, "Oh, I can't stop preaching." I got. I got to keep preaching. No, I literally stopped my sermon, mm -hmm. check up on the lady, make sure she's okay, and then I resume my sermon because I have control. Uh, it's not like I'm start preaching or I start teaching and I can't stop. Of course, we can. So he has to put down all these um, regulations about the prophetic gifts uh, because it's important. Now, like other gifts. The prophetic gift is important, and the Bible makes it very clear that we're not to uh, be against it. Let me read a passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Towards the end there, Paul gives instructions. I want to read it because it is relevant to what we're talking about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 19. Mm-hmm. He says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Um, so it becomes very clear that we are not to hate prophetic word. Mm -hmm. If there's a message that comes, we should listen to it, uh, but we should not accept it blindly. Never. If someone says, I have a word from the Lord, I will listen to you. Mm -hmm. But then I will test that to see if it is from God. Because, you know, let's be honest. We've all had people come up to us and say, oh, I got a word from God to God from you. Which for me, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, all right. If you want to say that, that, I've never told anyone that. <laughs> but if you want to say it to me, that's fine. I, I find it humorous because God knows me. So the fact that somebody would say that to me is like my it, my internal, my mind is saying God knows my phone number. Mm -hmm. He's never been bashful to tell me off if he has to tell me off. So I don't know why he would send somebody else. That's like the one time I saw John MacArthur, who does not believe in, in, in the prophetic voice. Right. He doesn't believe there are any prophets today. Right. And, and, he, and there was this guy who was visiting his church. You can look it up. It's on the internet. Uh, he was uh, from someplace like Germany or Switzerland, whatever. And they, you know, MacArthur's church, he said it was like some sort of missionary. They welcomed him. He sat mm -hmm. there in front. They were very kind to him. And in the middle of service, he gets up, walks up, uh, walks up on the pulpit, right? And starts pointing the finger. MacArthur says, oh, I have a mess. I have a prophetic word for you. The Lord says you're going to be condemned. You're going to be cursed because you don't believe in the prophetic word of God. Blah, blah, blah. Really? And I said to myself, that is a lie. Because God knows John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. God knows how to get to John MacArthur. If he wants to get to John MacArthur, this is not the way he would do it. Right. John MacArthur will reject it because he doesn't believe in it. If you don't believe in the prophetic word, why would God send you a prophet? That's like God mm. works with us according to who we are. And if he knows that I'm not going to listen to this, why would he say, I mean, like, for example, you know, uh, although he's normally I, I use an example if he's watching, but I, I, I'll have to use him anyhow. If Randy ever started speaking in tongues, I would listen mm. because I know Randy. I've known Randy since I feel, I feel like, you know, like since my childhood, I've been with him so long. We've been together for so long. We've worked in ministry together for so long. If he got up and spoke and spoke in tongues, I would listen. I would say, well, God definitely wants to say something. I want to hear what it is. Because mm. I know him, I can trust him. And this is what we have to know about prophets and stuff like that. When somebody comes into your congregation um, and you don't know who they are and they start talking prophetically or tongues or whatever, I would silence them like that. Mm. You're not part of this congregation. And I do believe there's prophetic word today, but the prophetic word is for that congregation. Mm -hmm. Meaning God has word for, for example, God speaks in the congregation through the leadership of the church. He speaks through my through my trustees and he guides me through them. 
He, he speaks to me through my deacons. He speaks to me through my through a teacher, Victor. Uh, he speaks through, uh, through authorities that he has placed in this church. Mm -hmm. If some random person comes in, I never, I would never listen to them because I don't know who they are. They're not tested. We don't know who right. they are at all. Uh, and we should be very cautious of that. So I think the prophetic word is definitely here today, uh, but not in the sense of, of course, um, saying anything that would pertain to the future, let's say, of the world or whatever, because we already have that in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. We already have the, the final prophetic word, but it might be a prophetic word for that congregation. You know, God wants to give them to that congregation. Um, and that I have no problem with. But again, it would have to be somebody that's acknowledged. For example, when you read the book of Acts, mm -hmm. when uh, there was a service going on and the prophet Agabus gets up, he is known. Everybody knows who he is. He's, he's made numerous prophecies and he prophesies about what's going to happen to Paul. You listen to it. Now, ironically, even though he tells Paul what is going to happen to him, if he goes to Rome, mm -hmm. Paul still goes to Rome. Because it was the will of God for Paul to go to Rome. Even though he's being, he being told exactly what's going to happen to him, he knows the will of God for his life. He doesn't say, oh, Agabus said, you know, it's going to happen to me in Rome. I better stay away from Rome. No, he still goes to Rome. So that you can listen to prophetic voice. Again, doesn't mean that you have to even accept it. You have to test it. And, and even a congregation that hears something that, you know, God, I, you know, like I've heard people in, in the congregation saying, oh, I, I think God wants us to do this. Well, let's pray about it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. You know, if, if, if you say uh, the Lord wants us to um, tear down the church and build a new one down Bergen Boulevard. Well, you know, I'm going to talk to my trustees. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're people full of the Holy Spirit, too. And if they say no, no. I, I had one person in this church who um, uh, was leading was leading worship. And all of a sudden, they started giving messages while they, were, while they were worshiping. I mean, literally, they would sing a song. You know, we sing three songs at the beginning. They would mm -hmm. sing the first song. Then they would talk for about nine minutes. Then they would sing mm -hmm. the second song, talk about nine minutes. So literally, mm -hmm. it was like 40 minutes by the time the, the, the thing finished. It was crazy. So I sat down with them and they said, well, you know, I have to do it. The Holy Spirit is telling me to do it. Well, I looked at them and said, well, the Holy Spirit is not telling me for you to do this. So, no, I'm mm -hmm. still the pastor here. And they laughed. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. that's, this is why we have to question it. We have to question all prophetic word uh, and test it. Make sure that it's from God. Uh, but prophetic word has to be tested by the word of God. Right. And if it goes contrary to, if it contradicts the Bible, eh, you know, forget it. And if they prophesy hmm. incorrectly, we should not accept them. You know, I, I made I made this illustration before, and I'm not kidding. This is the way it's done today. Think about prophets today. When I hear people who are say they're prophets today, they they talk about their prophecies like a batting average. Like you know, if a batter hits three out of ten, he's got three hundred. You know, and that's how they talk about it. Yes. And if some things can come true and some things cannot come true. That is not a prophet. In the Bible, when a prophet said this is going to happen, it was going to happen. It was not, oh, maybe it's going to happen. No, if he says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. If he says this is going to happen, it doesn't happen. He's a false prophet. You know? And right there, <laughs> you should go back on your YouTube channel. All these people who claim to be prophet, who said that Donald Trump was going to win the election. And mark them down, false prophet, false prophet, false prophet. They all falsified their prophecy. Mm -hmm. That means that they're preaching according to their feelings, according to what they think, according to what they're seeing. They're more like pro, uh, prognosticating, you know, and thinking, oh, yeah, he's got to win definitely. You know, and, and they, So I predict the Holy Spirit told me, God told me Trump is going to win, you know, and 2020 he did not win. Besides, of course, all the great prophecies made about 2020. I remember all the prophetic things I was seeing. It's going to be a great year. Wonderful blessings. And we got the COVID. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. More false prophets. Who saw that coming? You don't see one prophet at all. Oh, this is a horrendous thing coming for us. The COVID is, this thing is going to come. The disease is going to come. Nothing. They were all mm -hmm. prophesying wonderful, great things. This is why we have to be so cautious. 
We, we live in an age where everybody's an apostle, everybody's a prophet, everybody's trying to say that they have a word from God. And the Bible is very clear. Test the spirits. Mm. See if it is from God. And that's a wonderful way of saying it. Test the spirits. What kind of spirit is here? When this perfect person is prophesying, or doing, what spirit is at work? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it another spirit? What, what I what I found out uh, on the uh, <clears throat> preachers that preach constantly is that they instill fear on the people or they uh, overstate the issue. Something that we already know is like an overkill uh, that we live in a in a society that uh, morals and we know all these things, yeah. you know, we know all those things. But they, I mean, they they go over and over and over. Then the whole half an hour I preach about that things exactly. that we already know exactly I don't want to know I mean yeah. I already have the news mm -hmm. tell me how is that going to affect my spiritual life tomorrow exactly yeah. uh, which also again another, another thing, the, uh, yeah again which is the word of God should be something that's exhorting and encouraging and guiding not mm -hmm. something that's put to put terrify us into in, into those things but again you're right these are things that anybody can figure out if they looked at the news if they're following certain things you know and then uh, I remember, uh, you know, Greg Laurie again, in one of his sermons, uh, how many people think that we live in the last days? Raise your hands. I mean, what are we, kindergarten? Yeah. That's crazy. That's so, that's so patronizing, you know? And it's, so, and it's so wrong because if you look at the Bible, if you study mm -hmm. the Bible, the Bible makes it very clear that from the moment Christ rose from the grave, right. it is the last days. We but are they, they, living in the last days. From the moment he rose from the grave, that is the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. You know? So we're all living in, in the end times. But they don't say that. Now, they, we're, they have we're not living agenda. in the age of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Say that we're living in the age of tribulation. Then you're saying something different. You're saying that we're living in that right. seven-year period where things are supposed to be just hell on earth. Right. We're not living in that age. We're living, but we're not living in the end times. Of course not. But again, Greg Laurie has been preaching the, the, the end times since I was 15 years old. And here I am. Yeah. I'll be entering <laughs> retirement and he'll be he'll still be talking about the end times and people will still be listening to that nonsense. And and, they call it, it's all new people that haven't heard that before. So they yeah, believe that. Of course, you know? yeah. If you look at his congregation, they're all like a bunch of 20 year olds mm -hmm. that have never heard these things before. It, it, how come his current? Why doesn't his congregation have people who are his age? Mm -hmm. Well, old people, you know, or, or people in their 80s going, oh, way to go, Greg. No, right. where where did they go? Where know. did they go? I, I would say, in my opinion, they they grew up. They became mature. And yeah. they realized and they moved, this, moved away. This, yeah. guy's just, this guy's just rattling the same message over and over and over again. But again, no matter who, who's preaching, whether it's me or somebody else, you have to test the spirit. Yeah. Is this from God? Uh, and if it's not from God, of course. Uh, if it's not from God, literally at that point, you should not be listening to that person anymore again. When you have somebody saying Trump is going to win the election, no doubt about it, the spirit told me, and he doesn't win the election, at that point, you have to shut that person off. I would never listen to that person. You know, when Harold Camping said the end of the world's coming, and it didn't come. Uh, it didn't come, it, huh? It didn't come. They should have stopped listening to him. But instead right. he said, oh, I made a miscount. Oh, no. Yeah. God changed his mind. That's what he said. The first time. Yeah. First time he was supposed to come. He didn't come. He says, God changed his mind. Right there. I'm like, okay. Right there. Everybody should have walked out. But they kept they kept drinking the Kool-Aid. Hmm. And then he preached the second yeah. time. And again, so many people fell for it. And it was just so sad. I remember when I did the research on that, I was so saddened. People liquidating their 401ks because Christ coming back. There was a, one family liquidated 401k and they went on this great cruise. They went on this great cruise, enjoyed themselves completely because really? we don't need this money. Um, I had, really? I had a, a dear friend who, thank God, his wife was smarter because uh, he had cancer. He had colon cancer. And he said, well, why am I, why am I going to get an operation? Christ is coming back. And his wife is, you're going to get right. that operation. And thank God he did, and thank God he's still alive today. Uh, really, but he was listening to Harold Camping. People were being influenced by this, so we have to be have to so so careful. So sad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any questions?
No, no, no. All right, so we're um, we're going to stop there. And when okay. we start again, we'll pick up on evangelist. Okay. Facebook, great seeing you guys. God bless you. Have a good night. You too. Have a good weekend. Thank you.